Morning, everybody. A um, couple of things before I start. Number one, if you don't have one of these or a digital version, you may want to have it to hand. We're not going to spend loads of time in any one passage, uh, but you may find yourself drawn to one. Number two, have you got your little sheet you were handed on the way? Can you wave it? Might even call you down briefly. Fantastic. If you don't have one, there are some in the hallway and a steward would be very happy to grab one for you, I'm sure. So make yourself known if you need one. Um, what else? Who am I? Hello, I'm Josh. Uh, so if you don't know me, you've not been before, I'm Josh. Nice to meet you. I'm one of the team here uh, helping to serve the church. Um, we're talking about the Psalms this morning. So the summer series, if you don't know, will be on the Psalms. I don't know how much you're planning on being around. Obviously, holidays kind of pepper that summer series. But my aim this morning, I guess, is to dangle in front of you the Psalms as an option for maybe some summer reading, uh, some summer consideration. Okay. Um, I've got a little bit of a, an icebreaker because later on there's going to be an opportunity for us to pray for one another in the service. So if you don't know the people around you, I'm going to give you an opportunity briefly to chat to them now. And what I want you to do is discuss this. Is there a song that you learnt as a child that helped you remember something? So it could either be like, a, I mean, it could be a nursery rhyme, it could be a, a Sunday school song, it could be a song you learnt in school. Okay, and in a minute, I kind of want to hear if there is one that you remember. It can be the most innocuous thing, it doesn't matter, and I'm expecting my wife to pipe up with one in a minute. She's really good at remembering songs from church in her childhood, and she's now giving me evils, which means I've successfully embarrassed her, which is great. Uh, so have a conversation. You've got about a minute, okay? So off you go, people around you, try and talk to somebody. A song you remember from your childhood. Um, fantastic, thank you. We're going to come back to that a little bit later on, those kind of things that we do or don't remember. Um, I've got kind of a few things to say this morning. I'm going to talk about what a psalm is. Uh, there were loads of different ways that I could have gone with this. I thought about, well, should we, should we break it down into the sections the psalms go in? And I kind of went down that path and no, I didn't feel that was quite right. Um, instead, I kind of want to talk about worship this morning. Okay, our worship and how the psalms might inform that. So yeah, we're going to look at what a psalm means. We're going to look at um, different things to do with kind of... Um, remembering. Psalms help us to remember something. So that'll be another section that we look at. We're also going to look at the fact that life's not always straightforward or easy. We're, we're called to be sufferers at times, aren't we? And so we're going to talk about Psalms as a sacrifice of praise. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to consider how we translate to how we worship God. And I don't necessarily mean on a Sunday morning, although it might apply. I mean in our daily lives. How do we worship God? Uh, and what are the things that we're, we're saying and declaring, not just with our lips, but also with what we do. So, an introduction. The Psalms. Here's the internet slash dictionary slash commentaries definition of what a psalm is. It's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew praise songs that were composed by numerous writers over hundreds of years. There you go. I'm done. I can, I can get down, right? That's it. That's the answer. That's the introduction to the Psalms. But as a one-sentence summary, it's so incomplete, isn't it, in terms of what they actually are. It leaves out important dimensions for us. So I want us to explore where they came from. Why are they still here after thousands of years? Why are they still relevant to us? And how do they model, in surprising ways, what the author of Hebrews calls acceptable worship? If you want to look at that passage later, it's Hebrews 12, 28. It talks about acceptable worship. And then I hope we're going to come back to that definition and make it better. Okay, we're going to make it a better definition, I think. So I'm not a big one. You know, that, like people say, right, where does the word come from? The Greek for this and the Hebrew. I'm not a big one for that unless it helps us understand something a little bit more. It's not about me looking any more clever because I didn't come up with it, I just read it, okay? Um, so why do we call them psalms? The word psalm is an English translation of the Greek word psalmos, which means song, brilliant. And psalmos is a Greek translation of a Hebrew word that means 
song as well. So that's how we know they were intended to be sung. And in my one-sentence summary, I refer to that. I said praise songs. And you might say, yeah, fantastic. Some obviously fit that description. Psalm 135, for example, says, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. But some psalms don't really do that. They don't sound like the type of songs that we might sing in church. For example, Psalm 10. Have a look at it later on. But it says things like, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? There's a questioning element. So is it accurate to call them all praise songs? When was the last time you sang a song that complained to God a little bit, that said, what about me, or you're not near to me, or have you left me, where have you gone? When was the last time we did that? The reason it's right to call the Psalms in sacred scripture praise songs is because the ancient Hebrews did that. Now, one thing I did come across which I thought was really helpful was the Hebrew title for this book is Tehillim. One of the things I do, I'm a teacher and I teach Judaism, beliefs and practices. So I've come across this term before and it means praises. Gives us a critical insight, doesn't it? The original singers of these songs considered the breadth of all of these expressions, even the questioning, even the frustrated, even the sad, to be praises to God. So if these people that came long before us in their trust and faith in God, that's interesting, uh, if they've got a different take than maybe perhaps some of us do in our modern worship, it seems a good idea to reevaluate what we consider to be praise songs. My first subheading, if you like, if you're taking notes, is songs written to remember things. I asked you earlier, you remember a song that helped you remember something? These songs are written to provide collective expressions of worship. They're means by which believers can teach one another, can encourage one another, can admonish one another at times, to instruct one another, to remind one another, even though we go through the difficult times, there is a God who is unchanging. And these songs are meant to stir up for us adoration and thankfulness of faith. We, Paul talks about that in his letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians. And I think integral to achieving this is the practice of remembering things. Put your hands up in Sunday school, if you, or in school in fact, if you had to do memory verses. You remember that? I had to do memory verses. It was the single worst thing in my week not because it was obviously the bible that was fine i just wasn't good at remembering things but i am extremely grateful for having been passively aggressively forced to do it okay because it was a skill i didn't know i needed and it was something that was incredibly important when these psalms were written and we talk about this don't we when we talk about sort of genesis we talk about cultures in those days ancient cultures being an oral culture don't we they they talked a lot they passed things on they they couldn't read Okay, only a few people were able to do that, and they were the ones that kind of passed things on and taught. The vast majority of the population then was illiterate. The most important information had to be memorised, and it had to be memorised at occasions like this, where someone would say things, and they had to be memorised. And it's interesting for me as a teacher, because one of the most powerful ways to remember something is to turn it into a song. Now, if you want the definition of a tough gig, try getting Year 10 to create songs about information about Judaism. All right, it's not going to happen. Okay, it's difficult. It's a difficult sell. Okay, sometimes the odd kid comes in with a rap song. That's cool, like that. Okay, but it really does work when we turn information into a song or into something that we can remember, hopefully to a melody as well. It does help us to recall those things. And so songs have always helped us to remember. So I want to talk you through a few. Now you've got your sheet here, so you don't have to necessarily scribble all this stuff down. I thought it would be useful for you to have this and maybe stick it on the notice board or put it in your Bible for the summer and see if you want to come back to this. But have a look at this. So remember, these people are going through the same issues that we go through. They're just going through them in their culture and in their time. And so there were a lot of psalms written to do some very helpful, specific things 
And I wonder what jumps out to you. So Psalm 20 was the people asking for God's help before a big moment or event. In this case, it was a battle. You can have a little think about what that might be like today. It could be something small within your family and uh, starting a new school for one of your children or grandchildren. It might be applying for a job or starting a job. Something that draws it back to remember who God is and the fact that he is active and he helps and supports. Uh, Also, there are things in here to recall pivotal moments in Israel's history. Pivotal moments where God acted. So we've got water in the desert, pillars of fire and dividing the sea in Psalm 78. I wonder just for a second, what are the moments in your history where God has acted in your life? And do you remember those actively? Are those things that you recall and declare in praise? You, we, were, we weren't there with the pillars of fire. But we remember that God acts and he is involved. What's he done in your life? Others were crucial in helping the ancient Hebrews remember who God was. Isn't it so true that sometimes in those moments where we do want to complain when we do feel that God is far away. I remember sitting with young people for years going, I just don't feel like God's very close. And we used to get out the Psalms and go, look what it says. Do you think the people who were singing these songs back in those times always felt as if God was close to them? I mean, read your Bible, read your Old Testament. So many times they felt God was distant, but the Psalms were there to remind them. Uh, They were also there in Psalm 95 to remember who they were. I've got it here because the wind hasn't quite blown the page over, so let's have a little look. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. It's also to remind them of how intimately aware God was of each individual. We all know Psalm 139, don't we? Let me read it to you, though, because the words are incredible. One to four. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. For a word is on my tongue. You, Lord, know it completely. What incredible words to be drawn back to at those significant and daily moments in our lives. They also have good reason to thank God. His love endures forever, Psalm 136. And what I love is this, why in spite of the toil and trouble of life, they had cause to give God exuberant loud praise in Psalm 147. Let me read this to you. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is what the book of Psalms does. It draws us back to the character, to the nature, to the immovable person of God. These principles of praise, if you like, should challenge us to think, does my praise and worship look like this? Do I remember the things that God has done? Do I remember God's mighty works? Yes, in ancient history, but also in my life. Do I declare regularly how intimately my God knows me? Do I declare regularly over my children and my grandchildren how intimately God knows them? Do I come before God with praise before a significant decision? So often we come before God with prayer, don't we? Please, Lord, if this is right. Please, Lord, if this is what you want me to do. Please, Lord, close the door if this isn't right or open the door if it is. Those things are absolutely right to do. But I'm challenged to think to myself, how often do I declare God's praise before a big moment? How often do I call upon him to be present in that moment? I love the fact that we can say these things and the Bible's so consistent because Jesus also said something similar. The Psalms are written to help us remember a crucial truth that he articulated in this way. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. 
You see, the Psalms are full of absolutes. We've heard it this morning, we've declared it on the screen. Words taken directly from Psalms. We can read them here. There's very little ambiguity, isn't there? I am, I have, you are, you did. It's so absolute and Jesus is exactly the same. So there's our remembering. Now let's talk about our sacrifice of praise. Yes, it's good to remember. But God's people throughout history have been called to hope in God. Psalm 43 tells us this. Whilst also living as full participants in a world full of suffering. The prayers we prayed this morning about Ukraine, about all sorts of things going on in the world. We are called to live in a world of suffering. Which means that you and I, 2 Corinthians 6 tells us, we must live our lives as sorrowful, but always rejoicing. How hard is that? There are times when that is a real challenge, isn't it? But that's what we're called to do. That's the cross we're called to bear. And so, as you'll know, there are many psalms of lament, okay, in this sacred book. And it's in these darker psalms that we find the most surprising expressions of acceptable worship because they give worshipful expression to a wide range of emotions. I don't want to stand here and say to you, no matter what you're going through, just sing praises to God. Because you might be sat there and saying to yourself, yeah, but... You don't understand, yeah, but this is really difficult, or I've been dealing with this for years. Well, I hope, and again, it's on your hand, I hope there's a couple of things that might encourage you, and I, I urge you to go away over the summer and have a look at this, but they write with startling honesty. They are unbelievably transparent about the things that they're going through. Psalm 22 tells us, that they felt abandoned by God. Psalm 41 tells us that they suffered severe illness. Psalm 54 says that they feared great danger. Psalm 73 says they almost give up on God out of disillusionment. Psalm 77, they experienced a faith crisis. Psalm 88, they endured chronic, lifelong, severe depression. Psalm 89, they felt dismayed over God, seemingly neglecting to keep his promises. I could go on, the list is there for you. I'm not saying it's an exhaustive range, but I think it's a pretty, pretty brutal range, isn't it? Of things that they were experiencing at that time. But they chose to expose those feelings for the benefit of God's people. Because they knew that others would be experiencing those things at the same time. And what they do is they encourage the reader to believe God's promises over their perceptions, over our perceptions. So often we have such a, a, a kind of blinkered view of what, what's going on in our lives. It's only when we share what we're going through that we can receive that encouragement, we can receive that admonishment, we can receive that reminder of who God is and what he said that he's going to do and has even done. But why can we still consider those songs of lament praises? Well, because, and I'm going to read this because I want to get it right, every psalm, whether sorrowful or rejoicing, encourage, encourages the singers, or readers in our context, to trust in the Lord. We see that all the time. To believe God's promises. And whenever, whenever a believer exercises and expresses true faith in God, that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And God receives this as acceptable worship and as a sacrifice of praise. So we see in the structure of the whole book, if you look, but also within each one of those slightly darker, more lamenting psalms, there's a progression from fear to faith. There's a progression of where we start and through the act of praising, we come to a place where we fully understand and know that God is sovereign. It doesn't mean the situation gets better automatically. It doesn't mean that God's going to click his fingers and sort it all out. It's not about that. It's about recognising that God is sovereign over all things. And when we declare his praise, we are acceptably worshipping him. It shifts the focus from us and our circumstances to God. To a God of hope and joy and peace. As we believe in him, Romans 15 tells us that. I think it might be time to revisit our definition. 
you know, that very short definition I gave at the beginning. So let's read it again. I said, the Book of Psalms is a collection of 158 ancient Hebrew praise psalms composed by numerous writers over hundreds of years in order to help God's people in every circumstance know that God is the only source of salvation that they most need, the joy and peace they most long for, so that they will always put their full hope in him. As we go into the summer, we're going to be a bit dispersed, aren't we? We're going to be going off to different places, having our holidays, having our breaks, whatever it might be. If you're looking for something to fall back on, if you come across someone either that you know or you don't know and you get into a conversation about faith, and they're going through a tough time, perhaps you might fall back on a psalm. Perhaps that might provide you with that inspirational thing to say in that moment. Can I introduce you to my God? Can I introduce you to the God who never changes? The God who knows everything about you? The God who walks with you through every situation? The God who loves you unconditionally? Perhaps that might be a support to you as you go out and about this summer. 